Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Hello there, MSME radio listeners. This is the special second part of Losing Weight, Eating Bacon, which is episode number 37 of YEGMS. Since it was an hour-long episode, I decided to cut it into two parts for the MSME radio listeners, and here we go with part two. That all changed last October. My buddy Paul, who runs the Adidas store in South Edmonton Common, uh, and I were running the Grizzly in Canmore, for the second year in a row. And the first year was awesome because Paul, we, they give you nine hours to finish. And what the Grizzly is, it's it's a 50 kilometer run in the Rocky Mountains. So and I, I don't know how many kilometers of elevation there are over the day, but I mean, you're going up and down a mountain pretty much all day. And they give you nine hours to finish it. And Paul finished, I think, it, I th- we have a picture of him across the line and it's like eight hours, 57 minutes. Like he, I mean, They were tearing everything down, but he finished it. And it's, I don't want to make light of the fact that he finished with just enough time. Anyone who finishes that run is a hell of an athlete. I I don't care what anyone says. Like that's 50 kilometers. I don't know what that's, 40 miles up and down a mountain, right? Like in an actual, this is the Rocky Mountains, not those things that they call mountains out east, but this is the Rocky Mountains. And anyway, Paul and I were going to be running it for the second time. And Paul's just like me you know very active guy but always carries a little bit you know carries extra extra weight and I hadn't seen him for you know going into the Grizzly last year so this is October 2017 I hadn't seen Paul since probably late August you know you get into September summer's over things start happening and then the uh, you know the, the Grizzly was on October 8th I think so it had been like a month and a bit since I'd seen a month and a half probably since the last time I saw him. He was noticeably thinner. Like so much so I just looked at him and I was I, so much so that I was like, holy cow, is he sick? Like, you know, you got something you got to tell me. Um, and he didn't look sick. It just, when somebody has that dr- dramatic type of weight loss over such a short period of time, I went, all right, something's up. So I, you know, I said to him, I said, Paul, like, what are you doing? What is it that you're doing? And he explained it to me. And through another friend of his, they, they had told him about the ketogenic diet. And if you, if anybody out there, and probably some of you are listeners to the Joe Rogan podcast, I mean, I think it's one of the more pod, popular podcasts in the English speaking world. Um, it's one of my favorites. You'll Hopefully you've watched the episodes with Dr. Laura Patrick or Rob Wolf or uh, who are some of the ones he's had on there to talk about the ketogenic diet. Anyway, he's had a number of people on there. And he explained it to me. And basically you're trying to get all your calories from fat, which I know the second I say that, there's some people listening around them where they're just like, that is really counterintuitive. Because fat's supposed to be evil, right? So he explained it to me. And I said, okay. The other thing it really restricts and almost pretty much eliminates are carbohydrates and you're trying to, you're really trying to limit your sugar. It's impossible to 100% eliminate that stuff, but I mean like as much as possible. 
And people have heard about low carb diets before, right? So, anyway, he explained it to me. And I'm not going to explain the whole ketogenic. You need to look up keto diet or ketogenic diet online. And it, it was eerily similar to something I, I, I had done in my early 20s. Not exactly the same, but it was similar. And I had, did experience dramatic weight loss then. It wasn't called the ketogenic diet. It was just, I think at the time, I, was, I, you know, I eliminated bread and pasta and a few other things, and it made a big difference. Uh, but, of course, I started eating that stuff again, the weight came back. So I thought, and the one attraction to the ketogenic diet for me was I was still allowed to eat bacon. Not every day, but, you know, you're allowed to eat bacon. Right? So I thought, how bad can this be? I mean, chicken wings, bacon, I can do that. And I don't mean to make fun of it or minimize it. I'm just, you know. So you're trying to get all your calories from fat, eh? And he said, okay. So I started I, almost immediately. Like, I think I started after that weekend looking into it. I eliminated carbohydrates. I eliminated uh, sugar and was trying to get more, more uh, of my calories from fat. And lo and behold... When I left the Grizzly, on a, when I left Canmore on October 9th, my waist of my pants was a 38. By December 1st, it was a 34. So I lost four inches off my weight from the second week of October to the first week of December. And beyond, after the, I, I was so, my, I was sore and beat up after running the, uh, the Grizzly. I really didn't exercise at all in that m month and a half. Like, at all. I didn't start ex exercising until January. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. That small alteration in my diet, I lost more inches off my waist and more fat in a month and a half, not exercising that I did in two years and 3,000 kilometers of training. So back to my initial point that I was trying to make probably 12 minutes ago is that if you're not feeling yourself properly, you're just not going to have the results. It's just that you're not. Now, I know I've mentioned the ketogenic diet. I know I've mentioned it before on the podcast. But what I've also mentioned in my podcast, and I don't want everybody to run out and think that the keto diet is going to work, make, work wonders for them. I can't make that claim. I can only tell you what it's done for me. Because as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, I'm learning more and more about the gut biome and how we're all, we all have different makeups that way. There's no one perfect diet for everyone. And I really believe that with all my heart and, all, and everything that I'm reading and, and being, been exposed to is really indicating there just isn't one perfect diet. You might not, you may not do well on a ketogenic diet. You may already be a person that can burn carbohydrates and, and sugars efficiently, right? We're all different. And it comes, there's so many different factors from genetics to age to your gut biome to, and there's probably factors we yet to, we don't even understand yet. So that's important to note. But I think, and I, again, I've mentioned this before, I think what's important to try and discover is like, what is the ideal diet for you? And testing out different foods and how do I react to that? How do I, you know, and then what are the signs? Like for me, I can tell now when I've eaten something that's just not good for me, I start to bloat almost immediately. I'm talking within minutes. I can feel that tightness in my stomach and that really full feeling, I think. And that's, you know, and the interesting part about that is before I started really altering my, and, and finding out about this other, this new diet, this keto diet that really seems to work for me, is if I eat something I, I shouldn't, I feel it almost immediately. I, I can just tell. If I have something that has too much sugar in it, I get a headache almost, I almost feel hungover right away. Um, if I eat something like a, a carbohydrate or something, I start to bloat almost right away. And now these foods that I ate my entire life that I used to think I loved, 
I can't even go near. Uh, it's just it's it's really it's really neat how that's worked. And I you know so back to my point like if you can fuel yourself properly you're gonna have better results and. I think, you know, you can lose weight by, you know, through exercising, because really that's just, you're, you're right there, but th th then it's that, cal you know, that calorie type weight loss, where you're trying to burn more calories than you take in, and then you combine that with restricting calories. That isn't a long-term solution. It's just not. Uh, you know, because you're going to get hungry. Like, it's, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just as simple as that. Um, But, then, but another thing, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the diet front, another thing I found really, really fascinating this week is when I got diagnosed in 2007 and I came upon the work of Dr. Lauren Cordain and talking about the Paleolithic diet and how it may be a prescription for a lot of the stuff that ails us, you know, because of our current modern diet. And that, that paper is available on my website. You can click on it. It's uh, you can download it for free. You know, it's there. Um, and I started eating that way. And and at the time, no doctor or MS nurse would even discuss diet with me, let alone the paleo diet. Now, it's not my current neurologist. I'm, Dr. Brad's a great guy. I'm not. Uh, I'm not commenting on him. It was my first neurologist that I had. Um, diet was a non-factor. Now, my current neurologist is more open to stuff. I mean, but there's still, you know, right? But so I started on the paleo diet in 2007, and like I've said before on this podcast, I was about 85, 90 percent of the time. You know, and then I ten percent of the time I was eating something that wasn't on it. And you know, I was also on the MS. I've been on the MS meds now since twenty eleven. Uh, and the whole of the while, I've been taking vitamin D, and and and, uh, and then the exercise started late two thousand seven and, and into two thousand eight. And I, I believe it's all been a factor. And then the keto diet. Uh, a lot of the stuff you're not supposed to eat is on the paleo diet, uh, you know, but just the quantities and proportions and, and things are different, but uh, anyway, but since I switched my, switching my diet in 2007, and then now in the last, well, since October, going on more of a ketogenic style of diet, I've taken nothing but grief, not, not only just from uh, I'm not talking about just my neurologist, like just doctors in general, and um, or when you're over at people's houses, they're always like, oh, you're one of those, and, and you know, the comments are made, you're, you know, your diet's this, your diet's that, like, it's crazy, why can't you eat bread, you're depriving your children, blah, blah, blah. Um, but my dad has been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, and they're concerned he's going to become diabetic any, pretty much any day. So my dad's looking at spending on his remaining, you know, he's 62, 63. He's looking at spending his remaining years having to give himself insulin injections and being a diabetic and having to take his blood sugar and doing all that stuff. So he went met, met with his doctor, and this is, this is fascinating to me. She said to him and wrote it on the prescription pad, which I can't share with you because I'm sure that's some sort of conflict. But, but she didn't pre prescribe any medication. She prescribed the, the ketogenic diet. How bizarre is that? Like some, what I've been doing since October, he just got prescribed to ward off his pending diabetes. And I'm not even kidding. I honestly wish I could share that, that uh, prescription. But what she wrote on the pad, and I'll put the links in the description, uh, or on the companion notes to this um, podcast. On the pres prescription pad, she men mentioned a, a, a uh, uh, um, a YouTube video he needed to search by this one doctor who talks about, 
you know, take the dietary, the government dietary guidelines, pitch them in the bin, and follow this ketogenic diet, and you won't, you know. And then she, so the, and then the second thing on the prescription pad was a link to a website that explains the foods you should eat with the, with the ketogenic diet. But why, why, why I found this so fascinating is 10 years ago, when I sort of entered the mental, the, the, you know, the healthcare system as an MS patient, diet wasn't talked about. Other than, you know, the Canada Food Guide, eat, you know, restrict your calories to X amount of day, uh, eat from these food groups and, and in these proportions, and you should be all good. Right? Anything outside of that, we don't want to talk to you about. Here we are 10 years later, and my dad gets prescribed the diet that I'm already on. And I'm, I'm not pre-diabetic. I hope never be pre-diabetic or have diabetes. But I was just like, wow. And I, you know, when he told me that, I looked at my wife and I said, in my lifetime, I think your, your my diet is going to eventually get to the mainstream. Because I think the stuff starts to become undeniable. You know, um, I shouldn't say our diet's going to become mainstream, but finding optimal diets for people is going to become mainstream. And it's just going to be understood. And, you're, and I'm already seeing it. I mean, when my wife and I met in 2009, because she, she eats a very similar diet to me in terms of the paleo diet, uh, because she has asthma. And she hasn't used her inhaler in years. But when she goes back to, you know, dairy and gluten and soy and all that other stuff, all of a sudden she has to start using her popcorn. Again. None of this stuff's been proven, but this is what's been working for her. So if anecdotally, she, I mean, I can tell you that's what's been working for her. Uh, I'm not recommending people put down their puffers if they have asthma. That's not what I'm saying. I'm also not saying that necessarily these diets would do the same thing for your asthma. Again, because everyone's different and has different reactions. But I just find it neat that it's finally starting to permeate the healthcare system. And, you know, it's really, it's, it's nice and it's, it's fascinating. And, and I am more of a, I've always been a big believer in, in the diet's role in, in our, with, with, with multiple sclerosis. I'm more, I mean, you know, I'm even more of a believer now because to lose four inches off my waist and I wasn't even exercising when I had just finished running 3,000 kilometers, like, it's just like, you can't even imagine it looking through my head. Like, everything I've been told is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It's garbage. And on, on that point, in the, in the description for this podcast episode on multiplesclerosis.com, I'm going to leave a link in the, the episode notes to a New York Times article that came out a couple of years ago that I was unaware of until just recently. And this investigative report by the New York Times found that in the 50s, they were already making links between sugar and heart disease and cancer and all these different things. What did the sugar industry do? They paid several researchers at big universities a lot of money to publish reports that put the blame on fat. And what's happened? Fat got demonized. So all this low-fat food and know this, know that, don't eat fat, fat makes you fat. It's a bunch of garbage. It's a bunch of propaganda that it's been proven. I mean, you can you you can read the the Times article yourself. Don't take it from me. Do it yourself. Read it yourself. Where they demonize fat wrongly because you know in our corporate world this this is the kind of stuff that goes on. You know, the sugar industry realized well. <laughs> This is going to get pinned on us, so let's get out ahead of this thing. Let's make sure, it, let's pin it on them. So 
so now I realize I don't actually know very much about diet at all. All I can tell you is what I've figured out for myself. And, and then I think that's something that any individual, whether they have MS or not, has to figure out for themselves. Um, but the entire time, as I'm losing, I mean, the entire time has been losing inches off my waist. I'm eating bacon, chicken wings, right? Obviously, with none of that extra other stuff in it that I, you know, lots of green leafy vegetables, a lot of cabbage, a lot of, uh, I mean, great food, right? I'm just not having any pasta, any bread, any cookies, any, uh, you know, go down the list. Um, and I was still able to indulge a couple times a week to go to Starbucks and have myself a uh, uh, chai latte with almond milk, right? Like, you know. So, take, I mean, I'm just telling you. And, and, and on the note of my, you know, losing four inches, uh, my size 34 pants that I have, because I had to buy a pair because all my clothes are too big, they're starting to get loose. I think I'm going to go down to a 32 here in the next month or two. Can you imagine? 3,000 kilometers. I couldn't get off a size 38. I sit around, eat bacon and cabbage for a few months, and I've lost six, I'm almost six inches off my waist. It's insane. And I've been eating fat. I don't count calories. I don't, no idea. I don't even worry about it. I used to have an app on my phone to try and count calories. I wouldn't go over a certain amount every day. Um, I used to sit there and scan the UPC labels into this app. And it worked great. The app worked great. But the problem is it, it, it was starting from the premise that it was based on it was wrong. So I'm scanning these, you know, UPC codes to get the calorie count. And they have to roughly figure, okay, that's roughly a cup. Okay, that's probably, you know, X amount of calories. Okay, I don't want to go over this. Like, oh, what a nightmare. I don't know, I, just eat, I eat when I'm hungry right now. What I realize is as long as I eat the right food for my system, it just doesn't matter. You know, but what I can tell you though, Doritos, not the right food for anyone. McDonald's, not the right food for anyone. Uh, if it won't rot, probably shouldn't be eating it. If you're buying it at a, seven, if you're buying it at a gas station or a 7-Eleven, you probably shouldn't eat it. Uh, you know, the heavily processed food, if it's, got, if it's got more than a couple of ingredients and you can't pronounce them, you probably shouldn't be eating it. Uh, those are some guidelines I could say that I've learned, and I think those would apply to everyone. I think the heavily processed stuff, you shouldn't eat. I mean, if it can sit in a box in your pantry for months on end, you know, that's a pretty good indicator you shouldn't be putting it in your body. Um... I could be wrong. I could be wrong. You know, I, I accept it if I'm, you know, if I am. But with the results I've had, and 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 basically, you know, I can, I can prove that I ran that far, and that much over two years, and how little weight that I lost, versus what I've done since October 2017. And you would have thought the reverse. Honestly, you would have thought the reverse. So on that note. I'm going to announce that I'm going to be starting, I'm, I, this podcast will continue, but I am going to be starting another podcast here, hopefully in the next month. And it's going to be called Losing Weight, Eating Bacon. And it's not going to have anything to do with MS, it's just going to talk about, uh, you know, it's going to be focused pretty much solely on diet and exercise. And it'll be a limited run. It, it won't be a... Uh, a, a, you know, a podcast. Well, maybe I, I shouldn't. You know, never say never. But the plan right now is to have it be, you know, a thirty-six episode run. And what, how the podcast is structured is, is a good friend of mine, and he was the best. We were the best man, man in each other's wedding. Weddings. I've been concerned about him for the last couple of years, and Dan's probably five eight or five nine, and he's packing on. He's packing way too much weight. And I know he wants to be an active, awesome hockey dad. And I think I, and I think I think I can help. So the podcast that is the, you know, I lost weight be, I lost weight eating bacon is going to be around. It's gonna be Dan and myself on the podcast, and I'm gonna start him on my eating plan, and we're gonna have to tweak it because again, 
I have a sneaking suspicion his system is very, 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 very similar to mine. Um, but we may have to tweak it, right, to see what works for him. And if you're interested in that podcast, when the first inch episode gets released, I will update via this podcast. And as I mentioned, this, this one will keep going. Uh, there'll just be longer episodes now, unless you're uh, listening on MSME Radio, in which case there'll be two-parters. So anyway, that wraps it up for me. If you want to see the New York Time, Times article I mentioned or any other links that I said I might mention in this episode, head on over to ownmultiplesclerosis.com. That's O-W-N, multiplesclerosis.com. Uh, that'll, you can find the show notes for this episode and other episodes. As always, if you can listen to the YEGMS podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, Tuned In, and the MSME Radio Network. You can find me, you can find the Own Multiple Sclerosis Facebook page. You just type in Own Multiple Sclerosis into Facebook. If you do send me a message through Facebook, it could be up to a month before I respond. Uh, even before all this privacy stuff, I really didn't use Facebook. Uh, mostly because I really don't care what people had for breakfast in the morning. I don't need to see pictures of it. Um, you know, I hope everyone's doing well, but I don't need updates of every time somebody burps or breathes. But anyway, I'm not a big Facebook user, so if you do hit me up through the web, uh, through the Facebook page, or yeah, through the Facebook page for all multiple sclerosis, I'll, I will eventually respond, but it may take a while. Uh, I don't log in very often. The best way to get a hold of me, if you want to be a guest on the show, you have questions, comments, good or bad, you can send an email to Sean, S-E-A-N, at ownmultiplesclerosis.com. Once again, that is O-W-N, multiplesclerosis.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or tweet at me at ownms.com1, dot com one, that's O-W-N-M-S dot com one. Uh, I think that's all the stuff I have to mention. 